Hi everyone, uh, my name is William Kang and I'm the first year panel lead for the XY tracking panel and I'm proud to bring this distinguished uh, group of panelists uh, representing both the technological advancements and the analytical side of uh, XY tracking data. And so representing the technological part is the VP of Stats, Brian Kopp, uh, the manager of baseball products uh, from Sport Vision, uh, Ryan Zander. Uh, Head scout, uh, head analyst uh, for Baseball Perspectives, Harry Pavlidis, uh, Kirk Goldsberry of Court Vision and Grantland contributor, and moderating the panel is Jonah Carey, uh, a New York Times bestseller and baseball writer. Uh, so, without further, uh, thanks again to our sponsor, Sport Vision. And without further ado, I'd like to pass it off to Jonah Carey. So, uh, we're going to talk about Sport View in particular, and, and the pitch effects, hit effects, field effects suite of products. And uh, I think SportView is a good jumping off point. The genesis of this product, it's, it's missile tracking technology. And now we're, we're using it to determine Steve Novak's ability to hit threes. It's just this wild, how did we go from point A to point B? And moreover, I guess, what can NBA teams do with this stuff? I mean, this was developed for something entirely different. And now we're just getting this really robust data set. How is it being used? Uh, well, to first answer how we got here, I mean, it was a it came from developers who worked on missile tracking. We didn't steal anything from uh, the military, but um, it was an Israeli company that did this for soccer. There's a couple of companies that do it in soccer, and um, we saw it as really the future of sports data collection um, as a company. And we had stats. We do a lot of different sports, including soccer. Uh, when we brought it to basketball, you know, to your second question, it can be used a lot of different ways, and that's. One of the great things and one of the challenges is there's a lot of different ways it can be used from a game planning player analysis standpoint for, for a front office. Uh, we have teams using it in the game from a coaching standpoint, you know, looking at reports at halftime to provide more context to data they already have. Uh, we're working more and more with training staff on physical and performance aspects. And, and certainly Tell me more about that. We talked about that earlier. Tell me yeah. more about that. How, what can you do on the health side that's going to make that work? Yeah, well, well it starts with we're, we're collecting um, location information. And what that means is you know not only where people are, and we're doing it 25 times a second, you know how fast they are, how far they're running. But you can break that down and look at more intelligence data around speed zones and energy systems and training loads and how that impacts you know, what you did the day before. Um, you know, there's teams that are looking at sleep patterns and looking at wow. training information and how this fits in. So until this data set, there was a lot of information teams had in practice and off the court, and they would go to the games and it was whatever you observe with your eyes. Now we can provide much more context around it to know, you know it's not just how far you're running, but individualized speed zones, energy systems, while you're accelerating, decelerating, there's a lot of different ways you can use it from a performance analysis standpoint. And Kirk. Team Grantland, by the way. All right. Nice yeah, job with that. Um, we were talking earlier about the idea that it's data driving stories. That you, you know, maybe you didn't have this opinion about this one player, but you'd actually look at the data set first, and then you can go back and say, and watch the game, be like, oh, okay, I get it now. And it just seems like that's a little bit of a different way of thinking about sports and the way that you've developed court vision, right? I mean, it just it creates a different element as an analyst. Yeah, and the word I use a lot of times is explanatory. It separates. Just the kind of visual analytics that I'm trying to do with uh, traditional sort of analytics. Like I like to help people understand what's going on, uh, how a player passes, where a player shoots, explain, and not just reduce everything to one number. Um, and I think Sport View is going to change the way we explain and understand the game of basketball. And yeah, you can't watch every NBA game at night. I cover the league for Grantland a little bit now. And so when you're looking for a story, it's really interesting because sometimes you, you, you're mining this data and all of a sudden you'll find something, um, a little nugget. And I always describe it as like the that can't be right moment. And sometimes it isn't right. Sometimes you've screwed up your analysis. But oftentimes you've found something really interesting, like Larry Sanders, an extremely, extremely effective defender. I didn't know much about him last season. I started to see the numbers in the sport view data. And then I, I went back and watched his film. And sure enough, those numbers were right. He is really good. So it's this, it's this way of... of, of, of it sort of turns some analysis on its head too. Like we're detecting things that you know you might not catch because our eyeballs had been the detectors in the traditional game film model, uh, and now we have computers as detectors if we can sort of uh, manage to code them in the right way. But for me, yeah, I mean, the visualization aspect is obviously what I'm most excited about. But there's there's countless. In a nutshell, I think SportView will enable us to characterize NBA performance in vital new ways. Tell people how fast Tony Parker moves during a game. 
Well, I, I'd leave that to uh, Brian, but I think <laughs> yeah. he, he tracked him last year at over <coughs> 20 miles an hour. Yeah, I mean, we did a, you know, we can track not only speed and location, but max speed, and he, I think he was like 20.9 miles an hour in one game, and, you know, it, you know, there's a lot of context around that, what was he doing, and, and the nice thing is we're getting... Kicking ass. <laughs> <laughs> he was moving, um, but we, we're also drilling that down to say, okay, he's, he's fast, what does that mean? We can now define things like a drive to the basket. You know, Tony Parker is very effective at getting to the basket, and you can see that with your eyes, but now we know quantifiably how often is he doing it when he does it what happens next uh, we, what is the relation to something else and there's a lot of for those who have done analysis there's a lot of gaps in the play-by-play -play data we're filling in all those gaps and then almost adding a we are adding a whole new dimension um, of spatial data around it so we not only fill in all the gaps in that timeline but also what happened around that because you know the, 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 the where this is going is some of the things Kirk's working on is defense uh, you know, defense right now in play-by-play -play is blocks and steals and tallies that don't tell you a whole lot of the story. Positioning, spacing, movement, your impacts off the ball, we can capture all that. The challenge is then creating reports that you can feel comfortable with and visualizing in a way that people can consume in an easy way. Yeah, just sticking with Parker on that one example, one of the things I think is exciting is Tony Parker is really good at changing the shape of the defense. And we can quantify that now. And we can evaluate what other guards are really good at that? Russ Westbrook, maybe, I don't know, probably. Kyrie Irving. Which guards really disrupt the shape of the, uh, of the defense and create opportunities and angles for their teammates that would not be there otherwise? And that's the kind of thing that is not a simple tallying right. thing. And it's spatial. Right, and one last example is I'll give you a, a plug for Daryl and the Rockets. I mean, uh, last year they Oh, were, we don't have to do that. Last year <laughs> they, were, uh, they were 25th in the league in drives to the basket. Uh, this year they're first. You know, they do it you know, 24 times a game, and it's James Harden and Jeremy Lin. And, and their points per possession, you know, general rule of points per possession in the NBA is about one. When they drive to the basket, it's 1.3. So 30% more effective when they drive to the basket versus a, an average possession. And they're doing it very frequently, they're doing it very effectively. And I actually do, have a, we'll get more into the Rockets after because I have more sure. to follow with that. Uh, I want to get to the pitch FX, hit FX, field FX suite of products. Basketball is such a spatial sport. And baseball, okay, pitch ball, hit ball, catch ball, but in fact, it's the same idea with data driving stories. And we were talking about, you know, you're mentioning Brandon McCarthy. Oh, yeah. You brought that up. I thought that was yeah, interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's, this is, goes to what you guys were just talking about. Sometimes when you, you, you can look at every pitch thrown every night now, thanks to Pitch FX, and you can go back and go to video, perhaps, and try and say, something looks strange, let me go back to it. Or you can go on Twitter and ask the, the pitcher himself. Uh, so Brandon <laughs> McCarthy, who's like the most active Twitter guy there is in baseball, I think. Maybe Logan Morrison, maybe more, unless he got smacked down. But, but Brandon had sense. talked a lot about his pitch repertoire and how he was only going to throw two-seam fastballs and cut fastballs and was not going to throw four-seam fastballs ever again. So looking at one of his games, there were two dots between the sinkers and the cutters, and I said, those would be four-seam fastballs. You lied. So I tweeted him and said, you know, you, what happened to your four-seam fastball plan? He's like, I threw two pitches that came out of my hand really bad, and can you tell me what, they, what those two pitches that you saw were? And it turned out they were the same pitches. So these weren't blips, data errors, they weren't intentional, something the pitcher was doing intentionally, it was something I was able to see in the data, and then go back and confirm and find out that, yeah, that ball left my hand weird, and both were, I think, extra base hits. Hmm. So that, that was an amazing kind of, you know, directionality of, of discovery. But with the hit FX stuff, which you know, I think Ryan will talk about more, um, we've had a lot of talk with, because Voros is here, maybe he's in the room, about dips and fielding independent pitching. One of the great things about hit FX, and also field FX, but really hit FX, you can really get into quality of contact metrics. You can actually get that initial velocity of off the bat. So you can start determining, um, okay, we can call that a line drive, but, or we can also quantify it as a ball that left at 110 miles an hour. So there, there's, there's a whole new opportunity there in terms of quantifying, just like with the running and the spacing, you can actually now quantify these things with the hit FX. And with sure, field yeah. effects, you get into positioning. Right. right. Yeah, hit FX is great because it's, it's independent of outcome. You always have someone who starts the year great, who's a batting average uh, or you know, balls in play is really high, and you look at his hit ball velocity and you say, wow, it's really not matching up. And eventually that person comes, down, comes back down to earth and actually yeah, vice mm -hmm. versa. So as a, as a projection and a prediction tool, it's very useful. And spatially, too, a lot of teams are using it for defensive positioning, especially around the infield. We met with a team recently who doesn't use our data and said, wow, we're really starting to notice that some teams we're playing are using better data, data than us by the way they're 
their, their, their positioning against our hitters. So yeah. We think one of the reasons that Darwin Barney has turned out so well in defensive metrics this past season was the, the Cubs had some of the best positioning and um, planning. They talked about it publicly about how they would have spray charts not just for hitters, but for pitchers. So this pitcher does not give up that many hits to the side of the infield, so therefore you can position your guy not just based on the hitter spray chart, but your actual pitcher. So I think those types of, the data's there, the information's there, looking at it in a slightly different way, applying it a little more boldly, and you got a guy with a gold glove. And we've got gaps in our knowledge too, and it has to do with availability. So for instance, we talked a little bit about field FX, which is not publicly available. Pitch FX was open source from the start, and it was obvious that people were gonna develop <laughs> off of that. And we can all talk about basketball guys too, because if you look at Sport View, you've got a situation where there's only 15 out of 30 teams that are using it. So you've got some teams have gaps, in some cases the public have gaps. I mean, what is the best way, the most robust way to generate the most interesting data? I assume it would be just everybody's involved, public, private, whatever. But if you don't have that, how is the best way to get out there, especially as an analyst, Harry, if you're writing about this stuff? Well, I mean, it's difficult. I mean, so I have to, I have to separate what I write publicly and from what I analyze privately. Right. So um, that, that, that can be difficult sometimes. I, I have to remember where I saw something and if it was public or not. Um, <laughs> if it's not pitch FX, basically it wasn't public. But pitch FX, that was really what got me into doing baseball analytics, the fact that it was publicly available. So it happened to have a set of skills that were, I, I happened to possess just for my career about handling data and, and whatnot, and it just became a thing. And you, it was a very powerful thing for a lot of people, a lot, a lot of folks, folks who work for the Astros and the, and the Rays right now. Mm -hmm. Started with because the data was made available publicly and it created a lot of innovation. I think that was great and, and a tremendous thing. I've obviously benefited from it. I'm not sure that's the right way. I mean, because there is a, a need to protect information. And with a lot of what Ryan's business is, actually most of the pitch FX and hit FX systems are not Major League Baseball. Right. So there's really a whole world where this stuff is being used in player development and organizational planning that we, we won't see publicly. And I'm not sure if that, there's a, there's a trade off. Right. You know, you don't get that crowdsourced innovation. Right. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you maintain some of the proprietary advantages. That well, it has to do with what you were talking about before, revenue model, you know, how much money can we make off of this, frankly? Right. And you know, are the, if the right. league is involved, is the league gonna give permission? Right. Sometimes we could all be out there and say, we, want, we all want these data sets to be right. available, but it, it might be out of your hands. Yeah, in a perfect world, we would just you know, give all the data out and everyone <clears throat> could use it. But you know, pitch effects was interesting. That, you know, that went free to the world, and whether that was the greatest business, business decision or not, you know, time will tell, but it certainly accelerated the adoption of the data. It helped us create more derivative data like hit effects and field effects and, and command effects, and that may not have happened had people like Harry not been working with the data uh, so early on, and, and it took us some time to catch up to realize, wow, there's some really great stuff here, because what originally drove pitch effects, or a lot of what drove pitch effects, was the media applications, which you see on television with the strike zone box, which you see on the great applications on game day. So when, when this happened in 2008, we really started to, to see it more online. The analysis happened uh, with people like Harry, and then we'd say, wow, this is some really interesting stuff. And then we would go to the teams, and the teams were playing catch-up. And still to this day, there are teams that are playing catch-up that are, are behind. And then when you create these derivative products, it's just it's a balance you have to weigh, and the economics surely play into it. I mean. Uh, there are a lot of people who would like to have this data, but we really have to weigh that. I mean, you know, the, our addressable market in baseball is so small, it's only 30 teams, so we have to protect that, especially when they're driving a lot of the business. And I should point out that you guys just didn't just release the data collaboratively with, with, with BAM. It, it was, you guys, Sport Vision also hosted events. Right. Where we would come and present papers based on the research. And in the, when HitFX came out, we were given sample data. So right. HitFX data is not public, but we got a month from a park, something like 15,000 right. batted balls. So we were able to drive some of the, like, here's what you can do, here's some of the limitations. We were really just trying to get free work out of you. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> and we were happy to do it. Because uh, we, we got the data. And same thing with field effects, right. which we saw, we had some criticisms, and you guys have gotten you know, way beyond and right. improved it. So there's a, there's, there's a kind of a happy middle ground sure. where we're giving you some free way where right. you're giving us what we love, which is baseball right. information. Um, and, and it's not enough to lose the proprietary value, right. but enough to get the innovation. So right. I think Sport Vision's done a great job with doing that. And I think that, I'd love to see that as a model for other, work, right. for other things as well. Well, and there's a reality though too, and you can't sneak into an arena and install a bunch of cameras right. and no one know you're there. So. <laughs> You know, the teams are our partners, you know, I know you work very close to your teams as well. I mean, 
someone's letting you in the venue. So you, know, you need to work closely with them, keep them on board, let them know what you're doing, how you're using the data. I mean, they, we're, we very much are careful with how we use that information. And, and certainly more and more of it will become available and it's the stuff that they're okay with to become available because it's not like that's, and we know there are teams that are doing stuff behind the scenes that they're not gonna tell us about. And, and, right. And that's okay because they're the ones that are letting us in. So there is a reality there, but uh, certainly this is, it's, it's too interesting and there's so many ways that you can use it. That you're going to see more of, more of it exposed, but it'll be carefully just like it was. I mean, you didn't just open the doors and say everybody have at it, but, right. um, but there are trade-offs. I mean, yes, if it was open source, everybody have access to it. I'm sure there'd be some great stuff, but you know, the, the fact is we have to go into these arenas and I haven't figured out a way to sneak in yet. It's the plot for Ocean's 14. Right. <laughs> so I want to ask Kirk this, because you have a vested interest. So let's, let's ask okay. Kirk. So um, you've only got 50 NBA, 15 NBA teams yeah. that have sport for you. Does that mean that the other teams are just botching it, that they're just, they're, so they're doing something horribly wrong? Even the great John Hollinger, the Memphis Grizzlies don't have sport for you. Thank Come you for not that. asking What's, me that question. Well, okay, because I, I was needling John about it, but I mean, are they, are they absolutely missing out on something essential, or does it really depend on what you do with the data? Uh, Where are we at here? I think a lot of them might be sitting there, and I'm you know, unfairly characterizing them without talking to them, but I think a lot of them might be sitting there saying, we can't, nobody knows what to do with it yet. Hmm. So, I'm not going to adopt. But the teams that have adopted, they're getting there. And I described it yesterday as sort of this 30 mini CIAs, the basketball analytics world. <laughs> and 15 of them have a head start on what's definitely coming. The, the film room of the 20th century is, is the sport view room. <coughs> but yeah, it's hard. I mean, it's hard to convince a team unless you can show them actionable intelligence that they don't have. Um, and we're getting better at showing them that. Um, but still, some of the teams that have adopted don't really maximize. They don't know how to do certain things. So th that's another challenge. I wouldn't say they're botching it. In fact, if you don't have the right people, then don't get it. Because you need the right people to run the system, to run the analysis, to extract the needles from these haystacks. But there's a room full of people that could help. <coughs> that's right. That's right. But I do, I, I do so think that's So find those point. people and then get it. That's what you meant to say. Yeah, we have a group at Harvard of five stats PhD students that are now looking at the data, doing some, because one thing about SportView, and probably hit, hit FX too, from an academic perspective, not only is it really fun data to look at for sports, and I told Brian this yesterday, it's the best space-time data I've ever seen, period. Like, I don't care if I'm talking about sports or public health or climate models. It's incredible. Mm. It's fascinating. There's real important scientific challenges there. The flip side of that is, you need really smart people to cope. And not taking any way, the traditional basketball people don't have those new age skills. And I think that's a gap. And if you don't have some of those guys, why would you adopt? Right? Well, and that's where, for us, I mean, it would be a mistake for us to say, here's a bunch of data, you figure it out. You know, right. We're doing a lot of work to help make that, yeah. that, that easier. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be simple things like, like I mentioned, drives to the basket. I mean, there, there, are, there are simple ways you can use this data, and there are very complicated ways you can use this data. And so we're trying to break down some of those barriers to say, you know, like, like I said, some teams at halftime are looking at simple things like, how many times did we get the ball in the post? You know, how many times did we you know, swing it from, from side to side? I mean, those are the things we want to start saying, okay, these, these are things that are quick hitters. That, you know, you're not going to sit down and break down some visualizations in the middle of a game, but if you can know, how many rebound chances we're getting, and it's a little bit more than just the offensive versus defensive rebound, or how many times are we you know, getting to the rim, yep. and you know that that's a leader yeah. to success, then you know, at halftime it's, hey, you've got to get to the rim more, and, and here's some information that's helping to back that up. And, and offense to me, I mean, we cited the Rockets, we can go back to them for a second, not only getting to the basket so much, on pace for the fewest mid-range jump shots ever, I, think it was, I don't know if it was you or Zach who wrote that, but I was just, yeah. that's amazing. And it seems like offense is it's, it's easier to control, right? Okay, here's my game plan. I have to shoot threes or get to the rim because of the most efficient ways. That's fine. But the, to me, defense is almost more intriguing because it's really these subtle things. It's, well, I want to get Kobe going left between 17 to 19 feet to shoot that shot. And, you know, if I'm James Harden, I'm a great athlete. I could shoot a three or get to the rim just through the force of my will and my talent. But defensively, it means a team concept. It means spatial skills and all that. So I'm just wondering, and I guess it'd be... For you, Kirk, analytically, how can teams implement this that their defense would improve? Offense seems obvious, but defense, it's nuanced, it's difficult. Well, way back in the art of war, I think it was like know your, you know your opponent 
is one of uh, one of the pillars of the book or whatever. But it's like scouting is not new, but you can understand the nature of your opponent in many new ways. Um, you know, you can tell where guys like to shoot. That's the most basic example. Mm -hmm. I always say, you know, James Harden has that classic NBA Jam shot chart. He's all threes and dunks, you know, like he's a video game character. But yeah, some guys like LaMarcus Aldridge shoots, he's throwback, 70% of his shots are in the mid range or something like that. So just knowing that, detecting that, where do these guys, where does Tony Parker pass when he comes off of that screen from the left elbow? And in providing that intelligence in the same way you would in sort of a military environment, <coughs> knowing your opponent, um, they're just like with everything else we've been talking about, there's new ways to characterize the nature of the opponent. Um, effective spacing, how do, you, how do you defend a pick and roll? Well, you can analyze your own performance and then and do it that way. But um, yeah, I, th I think it's, there's a lot of ways um, to, to figure that out. Brian yeah. probably knows. No, but it, it also goes back to um, what players you put on the court. Yeah. I mean, you know, finding, because you, you, no matter what spatial data, you, you're not going to go to a player and say, when they go off the left screen and roll, make sure you rotate down. I mean, it's just, they do that, but you're not going to use this data to prove your point, right? right. You're, you're going to have those conversations, but you're not going to say, you know, here's our most efficient way. Make Kobe go to 17 <laughs> to 19 feet and pull up off of two dribbles. Like, that's just not right. how they talk. But if, if you have the players that do that more often and you can put those combinations together, I mean, simple things like defensive matchups, who's guarding whom and what does that mean? Um, yeah. How does that impact what they do on the offensive side when they're having to chase a certain guy around? So <coughs> identifying players, I mean, you were talking about Larry Sanders and how effective he yeah. is and how that surprised you. Yeah. So identifying those players and putting the right combination of players together yeah. is really what it's going to be all so about. So one fascinating thing, in the free agent period, you can, oh, we just lost Larry Sanders. Who's the guy who most plays like that, hmm. right? And traditionally, that'd be like, okay, let's look at blocks. Uh, you know, some more advanced possession stats and stuff. But now we can, oh, we want to replace Larry Sanders. I think the Celtics did a good job, at least on paper, of replacing Ray Allen with Courtney Lee and Jason Terry because they're very good corner three shooters. Uh, but that idea of like, okay, this guy's leaving. We really enjoyed his production. Who is the most similar player? Hmm. Not just in terms of their basketball card, the back of their basketball card, but in terms of how they move, what they do, what they're good at. Um, and stuff like that. So I think that's another way that the yeah. teams can really. There's opportunities like that in baseball to pitch FX, where you can look at a pitcher and not just say that he's similar based on his age or physique, um, but uh, what or their 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 walk to strikeout ratio. You can actually say they have a similar repertoire of pitches. Mm -hmm. And one of the things now we have so much data with some pitchers now, since the data set for some guys goes back to even a little bit 06, but 07, they have like 17,000 pitches on a guy. Um, and there's multiple people like that. You can start looking, we can start now doing research on aging, but also I think start modeling. If you find a similar pitcher, what would that pitcher's tendencies, you can almost say if you added this pitch. So if you, if you have these three pitches and there's this guy similar to you with four pitches, and this is a little bit pie in the sky stuff, what if you adopted this pitch? You know, and you can actually get some modeling around how your player's performance would be about. Now this would allow you to change up how you, uh, your, your pitch sequencing. And you can start bringing all those things into you and get your game theorists involved and, and start figuring out, okay, if we added this pitch, you'd be more like so-and-so, how would that actually map out into the field? And I think you can actually get to that point now where, where player comps, comparisons with biometrics and, 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 and tracking data are, you know, you, we can look at positioning. You can say what teams or players have a tendency to play a step towards the second base. And you can start saying, okay, well, maybe we can group those guys and analyze them on aggregate about batted ball performance and start you know, teasing out different, finding different groups and patterns in players and, and new ways to compare players with all this tracking information. And, and Brian mentioned this from a basketball context or from a baseball context. You, you talked about the idea that um, you want to try to enable the teams to know what to do with it, that there aren't that many Kirks around, so it would help if you help them a little bit. So from Ryan's perspective, what I'm interested in is that your uh, pitch FX came into the domain publicly, but field FX, for instance, which is behind the scenes, uh, you know, if they can't hire a Harry or a Josh Cock or a Mike Fast or whatever, is it your responsibility or is it the company's responsibility to try to arm them with some knowledge about here's these data, but here's how to use it? Right. The, the easy answer is a little bit of both because there's some understanding of what's the structure of the data. And there's things like physics behind it that we sometimes have to explain, but we're finding that a majority of the teams like to hire talent. Uh, very rarely do you see a, uh, a standard product that all teams use as an analytical platform because that 
they think lessens their competitive advantage. I don't think the Red Sox would want to use the same platform that the Yankees are using because they would be running from the same sheet of music. Um, so you know, our function really is to provide quality data. Um, and there are cases where we do help our customers uh, try to understand the data more, but what we find most of the time is they really look to hire smart people and build their own systems in-house. And that's the way they see their competitive advantage. Yeah, there's definitely a tendency for you know, teams have been the Royals, the Cubs, they're all, they're all doing the same thing. They're all looking, right. they're hiring the quantitative analysis position. Not everybody's going to be Tampa where they have a, a whole stable of people, but there's definitely a bring it in house because it's, it is a competitive differentiator. So what you're looking for is that intuitive data scientist who can work with the, the information because no matter how good your data collection system is, it's still data and it still has some dirtiness to it. It's just the nature of, of it's an abstraction. So you have to know what to do with it and how to make decisions on it. So you're right, you can't, that, that's not gonna be commoditized. Like tracking right. of the ball may become commoditized, but making good decisions about it won't be. It's all about who can do the best with the, with, with the least data. And even though we have tremendous rich data, it's still not everything. So you still have to have some gap filling ability. And it, that comes down to analytic skills, communication skills, and it's not just about crunching numbers. I mean, crunching the numbers is, that, that's the most commodity-based thing I think there is in sports right. analytics. Well, it's, it was interesting, we, you guys were talking before about NBA, about how some teams aren't, they aren't using the system because they don't, maybe don't understand it yet. We kind of saw something different in baseball, where if you asked me three or four years ago, it was kind of like the league was in thirds. Like a third of the team was just using the data, it was part of their everyday workflow. The second third knew they needed to start using it, were ramping up, and the, maybe the third third, uh, the last third, you know, really just focused on what they had as far as their scouting workflows and video. But that second third was buying data, knowing that they really didn't know how to use it yet, but knew that in two years they would have the capability. It was important to them for really to buy that data or to have that data so they could do a regression analysis once they, they were up to speed with you know, the, the, that first third of the, of the team. Yeah, so. I think it's an important thing with the amount of information that you're collecting in minor league parks. Is a right. big part of this is player development. Right. And it's, you know, that, that's, it's not just the entertainment value and looking at the pro players, but also with baseball, which is different than most sports and has right. a massive collection of people who will never make it to the, to the show. Right. You still want to track and analyze their performance so the guys who really matter are, you know, you understand how, why they're performing the way they are. And there's been a lot of breakthroughs in, in minor league park factors and understanding that the Pacific Coast League is it's hard to interpret numbers. Yeah. But these types of systems take those things out and make it get, get more down to the root, toward the core. You know, the actual what, action on the ball, the, the, the ball off the bat, the, the speed around the bases of a player. And these are all things you can do, but the technology makes you able to do it on a much broader scale, much more quickly, and expose it to, instead of having scouts in all 15 parks in a day, you can have one analyst gather that data on a daily basis and, and make judgments and action on it. We're I was going to say, just to that point, I mean, we, we are in more non-MLB parks than we are in MLB parks, which is pretty interesting. And we're <laughs> doing stuff with NC2A Division I colleges. Hmm. Uh, we're looking to do some things on the amateur side. With uh, we have, uh, We're partnering with a company that does smart batting cages. So five years from now, we could have a player that at 15 we had data on from a batting cage facility that's in the major leagues and have the same you know, standard of <clears throat> data capture for that yeah. same individual throughout their whole life cycle of baseball. And that's really what our goal yeah, is. That's, wow. That's cool. I mean, and, we, and you and I talked about this earlier, one of the things that I find most interesting is you have a piece of data and you can interpret it 10 different ways. And the example you brought up was Carmelo Anthony. <clears throat> Carmelo Anthony, well, you, you can explain the stat, but we, as soon as you said it, the five of us listed six different implications from this one piece of data. So I, and it's so interesting. It's like, okay, you've got a Harry, you've got a Kirk, whatever. You've got these experts. But it's not obvious what the answer to the question of why or how is. So go ahead with the Carmelo Anthony stat, and then we could list the reasons that this could sure. be the case. Yeah. Uh, well, we're, we're tracking every single pass that's made. Um, and so we know, you know, assist is a very, I kind of call assist the ERA of baseball. I mean, it's a very flawed stat. You only see a tally of, you know, when a basket was made. You don't see the, anything about any other passes. So what we started looking at, we started looking at effective field goal percentage on every single pass that a player makes. And, for the last two years, Carmelo is ranked number one in that in the entire league um, with the data that we have. So this year, not Steve Nash, not a point guard, whatever. Through, it's through the All Star break, you know his teammates shoot 61 percent off of his passes, you know, effective field goal percentage, which includes three pointers. So they shoot a lot of threes off of his passes. All three but, of those passes, right? All yeah. three. <laughs> <laughs> Small sample size. I didn't say how many. That's why it's say easy to track. Many. It's uh, I didn't say how many. But uh, I mean, it, one thing is this data really does highlight 
the really good players. But to your point, I mean, yeah. you can interpret that in many different ways. He right. should be doing it more often, he doesn't <laughs> do it as often, or you know, when they double team him, he's finding yeah. guys in the right spot. Um, and again, I'm not making a judgment either way, it's just now it starts to point to right. things that people aren't, you know, would surprise you. Another one that uh, we didn't talk about is rebounding. So we know rebounding, not just, a, again, a tally of a rebound, but we know whether it's contested or uncontested, and we have something we call rebound chances. How often were you near a rebound, even if you didn't get it? And the player who leads the league this year in rebound percentage, he did the same thing last year, is Kevin Durant. Hmm. Uh, when he's within the rebound, 73% of the time, if he's within an arm's length of the rebound, he's coming down with it. Um, and it's higher than anybody else. There are a couple of other players that are up there with not a lot of uh, you know, examples, but you know, people forget, he, he averaged a double-double in college. I mean, he's a good rebounder. He just you know, can't always rebound all of his own shots. So. Right. Uh, but it does, it does highlight you know, the, the really good players come to the top. Yeah, there's going to be those ones that you're, you're searching for that are you know, the Larry Sanders that surprise yeah. you, but it also just shows you some of these guys are even better when you get more metrics around them. And that, I mean, I assume that for you, that would require next level analysis. Okay, you've got this Carmelo stat. You didn't even mention what if it's because he has teammates who shoot really good. I mean, this year, Smith and Novak and all these guys are hitting threes. So, you know, you get this piece of data and there are five answers to the question. Is that frustrating? Is it invigorating? I mean, you have to, you have to solve this complex riddle with just one piece of information. But it challenges you to think about the game of basketball in ways that you weren't thinking about it two minutes before that. Right. And that's the best part for me. It's like, wow, that's really cool. Like, the Kobe assist thing for me came from analysis of this. Like, oh, missed shots. They're not all the same. They're not all wasted possessions. And... Uh, you know, when, when Felton misses a runner, that's very different than when Josh Smith All misses the time. a long two. But Tyson Chandler's always there. So you start to think about, okay, who are the players who have the most offensive rebounds uh, when they miss the shot? And who are the players with the least? And where are they on the court? And what does that mean? Um, and I think that's really a testament to the, the potential of the data. Is that, what do you do with that? Yeah, go any one of those ways with that Carmelo <clears throat> stat. Is it because his shooters are really good? Yeah. Is it because he's making good decisions? Yeah. Um, map it out. Where are these passes coming from? Are they coming from the block? You well, know? And that's the point. You say that's one data point, but we have all the data points that are before and after that. So I'm not going to tell you those, but you know, that, that's where you can go with this. And, and, and you know, the next generation of this is going to be, you know, just as we were talking about earlier, the video side of it. Um, you know, we have video from our cameras, but we're also, so there's a product that's used a lot in, in basketball, uh, sports code video. Now we can integrate that. So you could say, show me all those passes that Carmelo made where it was made. And you can, you know, have a tag of all those video events because we know people, you know, it's one thing to see a, you know, spreadsheet with numbers, and another thing to see the actual video. Um, we talk about it with some of the pitches as well. You want to see the numbers, and then it'll make you go to the video and say what happened. And it really, whether it's going to the video or going to another data set or right. to the same data set, I mean, really, what happens is you, you, your attention is is raised. Mm -hmm. You you may go back and go question some of your assumptions. But what really happens is you start asking more questions. So right. there's information should be actionable in one of two ways. I think one, it should be useful in that way where, oh, wow, let me go check that out. Yeah. And two, to the decision makers. And a lot of what we're doing, we all are, you know, what I, at the end, with any product I make for a client is, is eventually a decision maker will, get, that'll be integrated into their system and will come up. And the big challenge is how do you give decision makers information that's actionable and understandable? Um, and then allow them to drill into it. And this is not just a sports problem, this is across any type of business. How does an uh, information systems department give their CEO a, a dashboard for how the company's performing? And great, I can see the top line, but I need to go in further. I need to understand more. And that's where I think um, some of the folks in some of these other panels today have talked about analytics by non-numbers people. And that's really should be the, 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 the goal of say, make this information accessible to the people who need to make the decision. So someone who's a domain expert on player development is not going to be able to do what I do with pitch FX data, but I should be able to do something and provide it to them in a way that they can do their thing. And if I'm not doing that, then it's just a toy. Yeah. And it's, it's making it actionable, making it for decision makers or for analysts to dig in. But the end goal is always to, should always be, the, 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 it's actionable for me as an information seeker is an intermediate step. If I'm not doing something that's going to have a decision maker hit, uh, impact their decisions, I'm wasting money. I'm wasting cycles here for the company. So that, that's important. It's not just swimming around in data. It's having a, a plan yeah, and a communication. I think that's such a good point, and I think it's overlooked, like embarrassingly so. But my favorite definition of the word analytics is reasoning artifacts. These are, these are devices to help people think and understand and reason. It's not for the analysts themselves, no. ever. 
the analyst isn't going to go out there and guard Larry Sanders. But somebody needs to communicate. This is the, this is, you need to create an artifact that makes somebody understand something and, and create intelligence. Um, and I think that's so what, well put. Like, we need better people, not at doing the stats necessarily, but at communicating the stats and building those bridges. Yeah, I mean, I've talked to folks in, in major league teams that have told me that, that what they see as where people have not succeeded was because of the communication and the expectations of the, what, how much communication would be in that analyst position, whether it's, it's really someone down on the totem pole or someone at a, at a higher level position reporting to an AGM. If they don't have that communication knack, and that's really about listening, it's like, what do these people need from me to make decisions? And, and if I'm gonna shift their paradigm, it's gonna be after I've developed trust with them, and then I'll say, why don't you guys try something different? I have to listen and, and deliver to a, a customer. And that's the differentiation we were talking about earlier. <clears throat> it's those systems that teams build in-house, whether it's a communication system or a technology system. When that data, when an analyst or someone sees something, how does that information get disseminated to the right, right. people? Either the coaching staff, someone in baseball operations, uh, you know, and that's, that's really the competitive advantage, and that's how teams uh, I think are using the data most well, and effectively. One, and one of the areas to me that, that seems to be handled most subjectively, and it would be great if it was handled, handled more objectively, and it would be great if there was more communication, is the idea of fatigue, is the idea of injuries and so forth. Trainers, or certainly team doctors, I mean, they have specific training, and then you've got these data. So what I'm interested in, sport view, pitch FX, and so forth, is there an ability, let's say, to, you know, for example, the, the famous case where the Spurs benched uh, Tony, but the whole team basically because they knew that they had a couple games in a row and that became a big story. You know, can we, can we quantify how important that was for the rest of Tony Parker's season, the rest of Duncan's season? In the case of Steven Strasburg, an infamous case where the Nationals decided they were going to limit his innings pretty much way ahead of time. It, was that based on data? We don't really know. Mike Rizzo wasn't really going to tell us, but I'm interested in these systems that we have. Can that go from here's the data to here's the trainer? We can arrive at something that is more analytically robust. The decision, whether or not you agree with it, makes sense analytically. I think actually, absolutely. Um, if, you, if you see on baseball perspectives, we have a mechanics expert, and, and Doug will, will rate mechanics. And uh, there, there's things I think we can do with pitch FX and the mechanic rating. So basically you can, whether if it's the pitch tracking or just somewhat more generic metric about, you know, control or command, um, it, it, you can get to those things and say, okay, this pitcher had a, you know, a 40 balance score here and here's how his performance was. Now his head's stiller and everything's moving towards the plate. He's got, we'll, we'll give him a 70 score. And now that's, that's impacting performance here. Now that may, just be, that may be academically interesting, but that could be interesting to coaches, because they can say, you know, not only if you keep your head going towards home plate will you less likely get hurt, but we can show you, this guy used to do it, he throws more strikes now, don't you want to throw more strikes? You know, so again, can you put that information to the coach's hand and that really got to understand what they're thinking and how they're And will the coach use it? It could be someone who has 50 years of experience in the game and it's valuable experience and taking nothing away from them. But, you know, you're coming to them with a computer model and they're saying, you know, son, I was managing the Brewers pitching staff in 1972. You don't come to them with a computer model. That's right. You come to them with actionable information. Yeah, the cliche interaction with the grizzled old coach who hates analytics and the young upstart nerd who comes with a, the, the, is this how you're going to do this? Hey now, I'm not they're all young upstart nerds. <laughs> I, yeah, like, who are you in this situation? I'm the grizzled old coach. Okay. <laughs> no, but he says, he says to the young upstart nerd, get your numbers out of here. You, you, I know it's like the Clint Eastwood movie that came out to like respond to your, with the Moneyball book. You know, fantastic like, movie. <laughs> not a fantastic movie. But that classic interaction, I think there's a problem with the analytics community because we frame it as like, oh man, this coach hates analytics or he's not, he's not pro-analytics. We never turn it back on ourselves and be like, how are we presenting that to the coach? Right. Is there another way? Yeah. Am I screwing up by showing the computer, co the computer model of Clint Eastwood? You know, while well, he's got the empty it, Even if that coach is a real jerk and, and truly being obstinate with you, it's still, you won't develop as a communicator if you don't go, okay, I got to take that back on me. How yeah, come I didn't communicate right. that? Because I'm going to deal with egotistical, hyper competitive athletes. They're, if I want to do work in sports, that's what I'm dealing with. Really competitive people. And the people in the front offices are just as competitive. I mean, it win. So you, you have to be able to fit into what they're doing with their culture. So a lot of the, the conversations I've been hearing today, I'm like, I keep thinking about organizational psychology. How do you develop a culture? You know, a place like the Mavericks where Mark Cuban is, is a unique individual where he's a business leader and, and also understands technology and, and data science in a way most business leaders don't. He, he, he's able to drill that all the way down through an organization. So if you have an organization that goes, you know, we need, it, we need a good analyst. If that's not coming from even above the president of baseball operations, you may not be able to really 
drive that all the way through because how you set up your minor league field coordinators and how you set up expectations with, with your training staff is you're, we're going to be coordinating and collaborating with our analytics guys. But don't worry, they're talking about baseball problems and trying to bring it to you. And if you do that as an organization, you can have success. It just can't be someone trying to impress people with, with mm -hmm. right. great information. And, and what we're doing, what we're saying is, is, to your original question, is it possible? Absolutely. Um, it all starts with creating a baseline. You know, you guys with more years of data with PitchFX, you have a baseline. You yes. know that you can compare similar players in age and pitch type and mm -hmm. all the factors you have. We're building that baseline still in basketball. So we're still trying to say either a personal baseline or similar players, similar positions. So once you have more data, more history, and more of a baseline, you know, it makes it more actionable. So you can look at it game to game. Here's what you did yesterday. Here's what you're going to do the next game. But with more data and more time, you can look at, you know, here's how you compare this other player. And that when, that's when it comes down to communication. Yeah. And to me, that, that baseline is very important. Because if you just give Absolutely. a number without any context, it's very easy to shoot down. If yeah, you're able to say, it, 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 here's what I have, and here's the change, and here's how it's changed game by game. Yeah, there's a lot of factors, but you can't really debate that information. You can debate all the things that led to that information, but it's really hard to, yeah. to fight with that, that baseline comparison. And I think that's a very, gathering up that amount of data, yep. I mean, it, it also brings, it, it allows you to be more credible. Yep. Because you can say, look, we predicted this, or you, know, you, can, you can actually say, here's what we've done and what we thought might happen, and we can actually, because if it's just like, hey, I looked at this pitcher and he's really good, you guys should throw like that. It's like, well, we looked at other pitchers who developed through the minor leagues and, and developed that pitch, and it become, you develop credibility by having that amount of data because it allows you to speak with greater you know, weight behind what you're saying. It's not the data, it's the, the weight it gives And there's you. room for the technology to grow across the board. Um, you know, looking at how you could passively capture things like biomechanics, I think is a huge interest of, of sport vision and what we're doing. Um, teams have done that, but with instrumented systems where you go in a controlled environment and you put the, you know, the tags on you and you throw. ASMI and stuff. Right, right? Yeah. yeah, but if you could do that in game and the technology curve is getting such that you, you can start to do that, that's a whole different realm of analysis. I mean, the analogy I always make is if anyone, anyone who golfs here, I'm on the driving range, I'm awesome. <coughs> and I'm on the course and I got my friends, I got money on the hole, I got the foursome behind me watching, it's completely different. I want to see a pitcher you know, at 95 pitch count, you know, protecting a one-run lead with guys on second and third. How do they perform biomechanically versus when they're in a controlled environment? I think that level of analysis, I think, is the next evolution of what we're doing now. But that has to come from the teams. The teams have to say, okay, fine, we'll, you know, we'll load up CC Sabathia and he'll, he'll wear it on his sleeve or right. whatever. I mean, is that going to happen? Well, no, like, what the point I'm making is the technology curve is getting such that you're not going to have to do that. Yeah. Uh, there's there's yeah. markerless, yeah. you know, with cameras are high enough resolution where you can start to pick up things like knees, elbows, shoulders, and that is the kind of thing that coaching staffs do say to us. If we were able to really track somebody's elbow, and, and then that gets into injury, Injury prevention and understanding injury more, which you know, it's tens of millions of dollars at least in guaranteed money a year in Major League Baseball. That's a big thing, and that's the thing. An owner says, "I can understand that value proposition. This is where I will invest if, it, if I can understand injury more." Yeah, I don't think it's any coincidence that Josh Koch was hired by the Rays right after he published his uh, neural net experiment predicting injuries, because right. that's what the Rays were like. The next we're thing not, we're I've talked to the Rays guys at this conference. We're not allowed to say anything about them. We can't mention it. We can't. Shh, nothing about the Rays. It's very. Anyway. So the, the, the not raise. Um, yeah, the not raise. <laughs> no, so I mean, they, they, he had a model said you can take the pitch FX and see a drop in velocity, or change the movement, maybe leading indicators. But again, that's a further, that's great and it's exciting, but it's an abstraction. The type of thing that, that Ryan just described is, is even better because now it's like I'm actually seeing that, you know, that, okay, wow, his, our pitch FX derived release point may have changed, but it's derived. It's not as directly measured as what you just described, where you can say, you know, his elbow was in the wrong position. His elbow wasn't coming, you know, he was breaking his hands at the wrong point. Things right. like that can actually be taken out and not just be watched in video, but actually, you know, generated and have like, okay, here's a data set based on all that video instead of saying, watch the video and see what you find. That if, would be amazing. If teams, and the, to make teams implement it, and this is maybe a business question, so probably be you two who can answer it best, who do you approach? Because you mentioned, well, it should come maybe from above baseball ops, and if your owner is Mark Cuban, that's awesome, but even if it's not the team president, somebody above it, are you, Ryan, approaching the analytics department of a team with field effects data? Are you approaching the CEO of the team, the GM? Right. How is it, you want it to filter all the way down right. to the manager or the bench coach or whatever making right. these decisions, but depending on who you approach and what the communication process is right. in that organization, they might be wasting your data. Right, it, it's twofold. I mean, our strategy has been work with the league and that's what we have a great partnership okay. with, with MLB Advanced Media and that really takes care of putting the systems in place. Um, 
in creating all the products associated with that for the more separate derivative products. It really depends from organization. Sometimes we're talking to the GM, the assistant GM. Sometimes it's uh, a stats person. So every organization seems to be different, um, and they make the case internally. And sometimes we're helping them make the case uh, to the you know the people who make the business decisions. So it does tend to vary. Yeah, I mean, it's, same here. I mean, it, it's it's usually someone in the front office, but it could be. You know, we've had some training staff that started the conversation. We've had some of the coaching staff that are involved early in the conversation. Um, I'm sure some teams of the coaches don't even know this is going on. So, you know, it's all dependent on the organization, how they want to use it, and, and the approach is really dependent on, on who they are and what, what it is they see a value and how they're going to see that. And what we're trying to do is add it so that we can serve all of those different parts of the organization. It's just a matter of hopefully getting in the door and showing the other parts how they can best utilize it. And this might be a little bit of a writer analyst question, so probably more for you guys, but I mean, you've got these data, you've got this eureka moment, but you've got to convey it to people who aren't experts at this stuff. How are you going to make it work? How are you going to bridge the gap between I've got this complicated stuff to here's some legible pros? I mean, what is, what's the attack strategy? So for me, you know, I'm a, a cartographer by trade right. a long time ago, but I think Spatial reasoning, it, it, spatial data, spatial reasoning must prime a form of human intelligence that allows us to tie our shoes and walk into a room and not trip over everything. But it's a very visual thing. We're very visual creatures. And so when you're trying to communicate some spatial performance thing, <coughs> mimic the thing that we naturally do to understand spatial phenomena. So that's where building this visual model of the data that mimics or is congruent with the phenomena, whether we're talking about an assist or a jump shot or 5,000 jump shots, if you build that congruent visual model that sort of tricks us or, or it takes advantage of, is probably a better way to put it, that, that spatial reasoning that we we'll all have, that's better than text and numbers, in my opinion, because it's, it's the same stuff that helps us detect the line on Savannah or whatever. It's that, oh, that's a little different over here, and that's a little different over there. That's, to me, why visualization is such a huge part of this conversation. Because Brian is feeding me gigabytes of data every day, and they, I describe them as vast haystacks with tiny little needles. <clears throat> visualization not only allows us to communicate that, but it allows us to discover things really quickly, too. But yeah, to communicate, I think that's one of the successful parts of, of, of the project I've been working on is you know, anybody can get that. Tony Parker shoots over here. There's no words exchanged, there's no numbers, but I think that's why visualization, when we're talking about big data in either baseball, football, or uh, basketball, or whatever, visualization is such a key tool to have uh, to help us do that communication. I, I've got, I can say that from you know, readers and people who use the, the Brooks baseball tools on baseball prospectus. The visualizations, the, the, the flight paths of the pitches, we, we give you, we don't try and create, recreate the 3D model you can get in game day, and they've got that, yeah. but we put it like an aggregate, okay, this is this guy's average spray of pitches, you know, for each of his four pitches he may throw, here it is from the top, from the side, and from the catcher's view. And the feedback I get from readers is that, that they really, when they see that catcher's view, sometimes and maybe it's a top view or side view, depending on the person, and that's the key point, is that they really get, oh, I get what that pitch's action is like. I can understand a bit of the perspective of the hitter there. And again, it's different people see it different ways. So sometimes you may have to present the piece of information in a couple, you know, slice and dice it a couple of different ways, and you may have three people in the room, and each three of them may look at it, say, oh, I'd rather see it this way. I'd rather look at a table of numbers. I'd rather look at one of these flight paths. I think you're right, though. The, by far the most common thing is give it to me in a visual thing that, that fits the paradigm, like you said. What, how to describe the movement of pitch and pitch FX and how we measure in inches and what portion of the flight it is. It's, ugh. But if I just draw the picture, oh, wow, that's a yeah. nasty curveball. Another, another way to put that is like one of my shot charts has, if it were a table, a data table, which is a great data visualization by itself, but there's 1,300, 1,400 numbers in those charts. That's 1,400 observations. You can look at that in a spreadsheet, fine. 1,400 rows, scroll up and down, find the spatial structure, find the pattern. You're not going to. In two seconds, you can look at 1,400 numbers if they're encoded properly in a visualization and you get it. You walk away in two seconds and you get it. A coach walks away in two seconds after if you communicated that. So that's 1,400 numbers in two seconds, right? That sort of combined to, to show you something. And I think. Do the same thing with field FX data where we take, you know, and say this is what happened on this play. And then in the a few years ago when we had that data for mm -hmm. the talks, it was basically I, one of the cool things to me is like this is like art. 
You basically just say, okay, this is, this is the thing. I'm gonna color code these things this way and just doing, using our stats package to make these drawings that just show all the movement of the, of the play. And people look at those things and go, oh yeah, I get what was happening on the field then. What's behind that is an extremely sophisticated system where all the great engineering and incredible talent that Sport Vision has and the relationships with the league to get up there on the light standards and put the things in there, it's a whole big thing. And in the end, it's like, here's a picture. Oh, I get what happened there. Right. And that, that's powerful. Yeah. yeah. It's, and it's a big challenge. Uh, thank you for all the compliments. Oh, thank, thanks for all the data. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a big challenge for a big part of our business is broadcast, is television. And, and that's a challenge for us right now. I mean, pitch effects used on television is primarily where did the ball cross the home plate. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of the storyline and data that exists. So we're really working with our broadcast partners to start to use heat maps and some other visualizations uh, that, that viewers can really understand in a very short amount of time, and more importantly, talent. Can, able, can be able to describe in a very short amount of time. So that's another challenge as it relates to visualization. Yeah, and I'm, I'm embarking on something where, with the Washington Post starting you know, this, this Monday, actually, where we'll, I'll be providing some content for their website, but also helping their, the, the Nationals beat writers use this information to supplement their, their game, their reporting. And you would approach them in a similar way that you would approach somebody in a front office or whatever. They wouldn't necessarily be experts on the field, but they get the output. Exactly, and, yeah. and that's really going to be, I, I'm, I, I'm really interested in it because I'm going to learn a lot from that about what, what their jobs are like, first of all. I'll learn things about baseball from them that way, but also what it is, how they, not, because they're, they're hearing it from me and they also are very savvy about how to communicate. I mean, these are professionals, and, and so what they ask from me, I, I can't wait to find out on how we do things. And maybe in another year, we'll be able to say, look, look what types of stuff we've done, not just with the interactive online stuff, but with, with the beat writers and with uh, you know, just doing some, bringing that thing, bringing that type of information to the mainstream a little more, not just writing on baseball perspectives and places like that, but going out to like, you know, the post and say, here, this is what this type of information can bring to your entertainment and understanding of the game and not make it about data and information. That's gonna be the trick. I think my single favorite application of any of this stuff is the motivational one. So we have to bring up Roy Hibbert. This was like, this Roy Hibbert thing just completely blew my mind. So explain the, the tendencies of how Roy Hibbert's play changes depend on, depending on the circumstances. Well, and I'll give the, you know, the low data sample uh, <laughs> Doesn't matter. Caveat. We're, we're gonna extrapolate awesome. and assume it's relevant. <laughs> you know, we looked at, you know, obviously we know you know, how hard guys are playing based on their exertion and their output. So I'm not saying I can read their psyche, but certainly based on their movement and, and, and how much they're, they're exerting effort based on their movement. And, um, you know, we looked at some information and we showed that, um, you know, when he plays against the Wizards in D.C., he seems to, you know, kick it up a notch. Because he's from the area. Yeah, and, and when we were meeting with the Pacers, they said, yeah, you know, we, we, we kind of noticed that. And you can start to measure it a little bit. So can they lie to him and say, oh, we're playing the Wizards against them. Why would you just play them yesterday? That's weird. <laughs> you might figure that one out. I mean, but, and, and I guess that goes to what coaches can do with it. It just seems like you, know, you talked about the language that you have to speak and the ways that you have to get at it. Something like motivating a player, that, that's so elemental to a coach. But it, it could be something spatial. It could be something motivational personality-wise. It almost sounds like you can just go anywhere with this thing. Yeah, well, I think our conventional stats are every player knows how many points he has, every player knows how many rebounds he has in the game. Those are the, the, those are the stats of the day, you know? You know, as we move forward, what, what are those equivalents? Obviously, points is the currency of the league, and it shouldn't change. But, you know, what, what, how can you get players to, to believe, you know, come up with some exertion metric that, that they cap, that draws them in or something? That's a huge challenge to, to change the conversation. I completely agree with Brian. Assists, block shots, these are ambiguous in terms of their relationship with success on the basketball court. And assists are, there's a ton of problems there. But as we move forward, yeah, everybody, Rondo knows a lot about assists because that's the parlance of, of contemporary basketball. We talk about assists, but should we be talking about that? And that's one of the things that data really can do is change the language and the conversation and how we evaluate uh, and motivate players. And one thing also, we can get, this is actually one of the questions, I'll, I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit, but the basic idea is, you know, you've got these teams and they have the ability to make these improvements by investing in this stuff. Okay, but there's time, there's money, there's R&D, you have to hire somebody who knows what they're talking about. Obviously, you're going to support your product and you say, well, you should still invest in it, but I mean, tell me about the challenges of just rolling it out. You're, you're one of the 15 teams that doesn't have it. 
How difficult is it really to just A, get going, and B, get to the point where you have meaningful output? This could take you know, a couple of years or more, I would assume, right? But it all depends on what you want to get out of it. I mean, they're, they're, like I said, there's, there's very easy things that you can understand you know, right away. Yeah. Um, so once you get it going, I mean, it's, it's, it's all on how you want to use it and all on how, who in the organization is using it. It's, it. A lot of it depends on the coaching staff and their open-mindedness to it, uh, the front office and their open-mindedness to it. I mean, it's, it's, it should fit right into what you want to do. A lot of what I try to understand when I'm talking to teams is, what are things you'd always wanted to know? Because the fact is we could probably quantify it. And hopefully it's one of those things we can quantify right now versus something that'll take a little bit longer. But uh, you know, trying to understand what is it that you want to be able to quantify. Uh, because we have an ability to do that. You know, some of those are very complicated. If you want to quantify help side defense, that'll take me a little bit longer. If you want to quantify how often we're getting to the rim um, and how, how well we're passing it amongst each other, that's a little bit easier to do. So it's really around understanding those, those pressure points. And, and again, for us, it's about getting started. I mean, I've had certain people say, oh, well, this won't make sense until you have years of data. I'm like, okay, well, we got to get started then, because uh, you know <laughs> yep. we got a few years now, and we'd like to get more. I mean, I'm jealous of you guys having five years of, of data. I look forward to getting to the point where we have that. But uh, you know, that's that's why you want to get started and get going with it. And, and yes, there's always going to be reasons not to do it, just like any decision you make. Um, you know, just like getting players, like investing in your arena. There's a there's a decisions you have to make. Uh, but hopefully, we're starting to show the ability to help front office coaching, training staff, and break down those barriers to say, you know. What's holding you up? Let's get going. Well, and, and we've been talking about basketball and baseball a lot, but I think of a sport like soccer or football, more people on the field, more complex interactions. My goodness, a, a normal football play, just like a five yard in, is so, or whatever, is so complicated what goes on. Is it the case that there could be more application, more use for this stuff when we really get going into those sports? I mean, how would it differ with the application? I mean, our football might be easier because it's yeah. a discrete play, start of play. That's true. You, know, you have yeah. the, the, with continuous. That part seems you're actually tracking them. Is yeah, right. Yeah, not so easy. But, yeah. Right. So that's um, where it's, it's. But yeah, how? But throwing a is the bigger field a problem? You know, the more space you have. So, I mean, soccer. Difficult. The pitch is immense. In exactly. Yeah, I mean, we, we this technology started in soccer. I mean, we have we have, our our technology covers all the UEFA Champion League matches, and you know we're already doing soccer. I mean, the nice thing about soccer is you're supposed to be spread out. I mean, right. You're supposed to. You know, the pitch isn't the problem. The the the, the challenge within that is. How do you then interpret, interpret that? And how do you, you know, the spatial data, a lot of what we talked about, it started with soccer, the, the easy visual, I mean, heat maps are something that have been used in soccer for a long time. Mm. And, and, and it very quickly shows you in two seconds whether that guy's offensive minded, defensive minded, staying on the left, staying on the right, you know, very simple uh, visuals. So yeah, it started in a sport like soccer. And certainly there's other sports that th this will go to because it's, it's more analysis and, and, and hopefully that's where this is going. Well, how much saturation is there in soccer? I mean, is it everybody in the English Premier League uses this stuff, or some clubs? Do? I mean, no, where there's, are we there's, at? there's clubs that use it. There's there's broadcasters that use it. There's a couple of different companies mm. that have the technology. So it's you know, it's, but there's soccer played all around the world. So there's still a lot of a lot of ways you can go with it. So let's look a little ahead down the road. What is it that you envision? <laughs> are, are there certain applications for the data that you're working on now? You haven't got to, but a year, two years, three years from now, we go back to this conference, you say, okay, we've cracked this, now we've unlocked it. Well, maybe on the baseball side, where are we at with that? What's in progress? <laughs> What's that doing? Okay. Well, still perfecting field effects is, yeah. is I mean, that's an extremely complicated problem to solve. Uh, so perfecting that is something that's taking up a lot of our time. Um, and some of the new applications as it relates to what other things can be tracked in the game. Can we start to look at recreate skeletons and track elbows and shoulders and, and things like that. And another area, I think, is what you had talked about with baseball. You have such a wide system of, of amateur and minor leagues that there's still a lot of room to grow. Just the amount of, of tracking or amount of, of stadiums you can install and the amount of leagues that you can cover. You really, you know, that's a big focus of ours. A lot of that is, you know, business development type activity. But uh, I think, so I think it's a combination of really refining and, and perfecting our existing technology with field effects and growing that platform. Uh, below to the amateur level. And I think that pretty much sets up my answer, which is that it's in player in developing players and determining what, what it, not just identifying players, but also making what this coaching decisions, development decisions you may make. Um, so I think having that information and be able to track the success of your programs, I think those are probably the next things where you, you get to that point where the, the, the 12 year old who was throwing in the, in right. the, the high tech batting cage, well, we've got it, we got him in a, five high school tournament games and you know we can see his development and I think that will be the future and it's particularly for baseball because it is such a uh, 
player development driven industry. I mean, and, in, your, in your side of basketball, I, I don't know. I mean, that's a good problem. Well, you've got like one minute to answer the bathroom one. That's right. <laughs> so go for it. No pressure. <laughs> well, I think it's two areas. One is we've kind of touched on the performance side, you know, the, the athletic training aspect. You know, it's still early on how to interpret that and building that baseline. So I think that's something that as you have more data and more examples, it gets more intelligent. And the second is, you know, as I mentioned, we're delivering this data in the game. So making that faster, making the data available quicker. I mean, we're taking tracking data, integrating play-by-play -play data, running algorithms. There's a lot to it. Can people make but, adjustments at halftime at some point yeah, in the Yeah, we're future? delivering this data within 60 seconds. Wow. I'd like to keep getting it faster than that. Um, and so there's steps you can take to get to that point. But, you know, integrating the play-by-play the -play feed with the tracking data has a lot of algorithms around it. But if you make that faster... Um, then that opens up not just how teams can look at it, but also how media consumers can look at it as well. Thanks very much, Chance. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.